Welcome. Welcome to Breakout Session C. And this is Advocating for Yourself, a youth panel discussion. I'm Erin George. I'm the Communications Manager at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And as I mentioned earlier today, I also have retinitis pigmentosa. I'd like to introduce you to our three panelists today, and I'm so thrilled to have the, these three young women with us today to share their stories. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Laura Bridgman. Laura is 25 and pursuing her interest in social justice, fairness, and equality as she studies to be a legal office assistant in Victoria. Laura has retinitis pigmentosa, and she's also mom to an 18-month-old Joey, and Joey loves building sandcastles, singing, dancing, and hugging his mom. Uh, Natalie Ligonda is 28 years old, and she's living with Usher Syndrome Type 1. She recently completed her Bachelor's of Education at Simon Fraser University and is now preparing to do her Master's in Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education while seeking a full-time teaching position. And then our third speaker is Carrie Bavin. Carrie recently completed her law degree at the University of Victoria, and she is working at a law firm in downtown Vancouver to finish her articling requirement to become a lawyer. She was diagnosed with Usher syndrome type 1 at the age of 24, and Carrie lives in North Vancouver with her husband, Mark, who's here today, and her guide dog, Casey, who's also here working hard today. Um, today, our panelists will share their experiences living with vision loss and learning to advocate for themselves. Uh, please note, we are recording this session, as we are all Vision Quest sessions, but to encourage an open discussion during the question and answer period, uh, we will not be recording the question and answer period. We want, uh, especially any youth audience participants, to feel comfortable sharing any experiences, stories, or asking any questions. So please rest assured that that portion will not be recorded. So please welcome our first of our three speakers today, Laura Bridgman. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. I have never actually used a mic before, so if I'm too close, I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, so, like uh, was said before, my name is Laura Bridgman. I have retinitis pigmentosa, and I've, I was di diagnosed with it in 2007, so it's been uh, almost six years now. Actually, just six years. Uh, I am 25, and I live in Victoria, B.C. with my son. Uh, Joey, who's around here somewhere, you'll probably see him. Uh, I wanted to talk more about the side of parenting with vision loss, uh, because that's something that I am dealing with every day. Uh, so I have kind of a story, and I'll probably end up reading off of this piece of paper because I'm nervous and I don't talk well in front of others, so I hope that's okay. Parenting in general is a really difficult task, as I've been told by many, and at also no for myself now through experience. Uh, mix in being a single parent, which is my deal, uh, as well as being legally blind, and this is a part of my story that I'm going to read to you. I've known for years about my diagnosis, so imagine my shock when I found out I was pregnant in 2011. So many thoughts came rushing into my head at once. How was I going to deal with this? What was my plan now? Was everything going to change? And most importantly, is this gonna be carried on to my child? I was torn between my choices, constantly flip-flopping about what, what I was going to do in the long term, be the best for my unborn child. The environment and life that I have been living, particularly because of my de denial of RP and my rage from having this god-awful disease, had been debilitating and I was lost in self-pity. Being pregnant was the best and worst time of my life. Every day I would wake up and feel a little bit guilty about my choice to keep my child. There was so much outside pressure, constant nagging and not understanding. I had made a choice that few others could support due to my life situation. I hadn't picked a spouse who was supportive, and he had his own set of problems. Every day I thought to myself that this was too much. I felt bad that I was bringing a beautiful child into the world of chaos and denial. To be honest, I was selfish. A part of me thought that this was going to fix my life, that I would have something to live for, and it would change me for the better. I had the young, youthful, naive impression that my life would miraculously get better if I had someone to love me unconditionally. First, I would like to explain that I've experienced all of that in tenfold. 
but it is in a completely different way than I had initially thought. Having a child is a huge responsibility, one that took up to, until this point to truly understand, and I'm still learning. I was forced out of my comfort zone and expected to know how to be a mom right away, and I didn't. <laughs> I'm so fortunate to have been given that chance to be a part of Joe's life. However, all of this being said, having a child is a big responsibility, but not in the way that you would expect. The responsibilities that come with parenting are peanuts compared to the changes that I have seen within myself and watching my son as he learns every day. The only true type of pressure I feel these days is knowing full well that my child is watching every single move I make in turn to use it against me to see how much he can get away with. <laughs> parenting is a lesson. In my experience, we never know what we're going to get or what is going to happen in life. Being a mom has taught me to love with my whole heart because who knows what is going to happen or who we're going to be in the next 10 years. I know that anyone who would like to have children with RP or any other vision issues is going to have go through the same turmoil that I was years ago. Is it the right choice? How certain am I that my child won't have this? Will I miss anything because I can't see properly? Those are all things I ask myself. I had to weigh the odds and ultimately force myself and my son to live with the consequences of what my action was. The day that my son was born was by far the best day of my life. I can say with 100% certainty that when I look into his eyes and I felt him cling to me, that I had made the right choice. I realized on that day that my life was going to change because now I have to man up and stop playing the victim and learn to be strong because my son, my true love, was going to watch me. And he was going to watch me go through RP. And I hope that if that was the case, um, and this is happening, that he would see how strong I am being able to deal with it. Last year, I made an appointment to sit down with my ophthalmologist and talk about the realistic chances that Joey would have RP. This was a very difficult conversation to have, and he gave me his honest opinion. Very gently, of course. <laughs> the odds were even greater than I wanted to hear. My... Uh, my son's biological father doesn't carry the gene, as we know. Uh, but regardless, it's almost such a heavy thing to consider, possibly giving this thing to your child. <sighs> it was a very humbling experience, sitting in a chair, a million things rushing through my head, praying to the universe that everything be okay with my son. I found myself bargaining with the universe, repeating over and over again that I would take on anything, anything, if it could just not be for Joey. I wanted him to be healthy. The most humbling of all of this was realizing how much I wanted to be able to provide greatness for him. And in doing so, I had this like, aha, mommy moment, realizing that I had been giving this to him all along and that I still had the potential to do so and that the RP that I had wasn't going to defer me from anything that I wanted to accomplish. Since the day that my son was born, my life has taken a complete 180. Um, I have been asked so many times what it was for me that my life has changed because the pity pool I was in was just horrible and I hated everything and I was so angry. Why me? Why me? And I, I really did. I wanted to give it to somebody else, you know, and I'm not that type of person. I'm a very kind, generous, caring, genuine person and I wanted somebody else to have this because it was too sad. It was too hard. I was angry and scared and for some reason that day that Joey was born, it just was gone. And since then, I mean, I face it every day, of course. I trip over things and I bump into things and it's not always the safest for me. But I'm very cautious with Joey now because I, I understand. I don't know what it is either because with kids, I guess for me, I have just become more careful and I think that I want to just make sure he's okay. I, uh, <clears throat> I know that in my life, the things that have happened for me just with learning how to parent and learning about him and how um, he is very stubborn. <laughs> He's very energetic. It's tiring. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't focus on my RP as much anymore. I notice it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, right now, as it stands, I have just 3% vision and peripheral vision in both my eyes. Um, I'm not using a cane like I should, and I think that I'm still kind of getting past that, um, the overwhelming fear of what others are going to think. Um, and I've been told many, many times by everybody that there comes a time when that just doesn't matter anymore, and I'm going to go with that. I'm going to believe that, that it's going to happen when it's supposed to. So 
besides being a single parent and learning how to do it every day because it's different every day i uh, i'm going to school full time and it's crazy busy and that's it's different because i haven't done that in years and i'm taking the legal office assistant program uh, which has been very interesting and so far so good i haven't experienced any hurdles although the first day of class i did run into somebody in the hallway and it was um it was really hard for me to explain in a situation like that what's going on for me because i it's a very private thing i don't i don't want people to know i uh i'm going to finish off now but i was going to start off with something and i didn't want to because it's embarrassing but i uh I'm kind of sick and tired of people coming up to me that I don't really know, that know the story about my eyes, and they say, hi, Laura, how are you? How are your eyes? You know, and it's just one of those things. Every time, I just want to be like, well, what business of it is yours? And I am like that, because I'm a very private person. I, um, My mom and I were joking and laughing, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, and it's being recorded, but I just want to finish off with, hey, everybody, how's your colon? <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing and being so generous and getting over your nervousness of public speaking. I know it's hard, so thank you very much. And Natalie, please come up and share your story now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, excuse me for bumping into the mic. <laughs> um, so I am Natalie, and I'm 28 years old. Uh, well, technically 27, but I'm turning 28 this month. And I have Usher syndrome. So what that means is that I have a hearing loss. And my tinnitus pigmentosa. Since I'm type 1, I have profound hearing loss. So I was diagnosed at the age of 3 or 4 with the Usher syndrome. So I was one of those little kids that were overactive, running everywhere with glasses that kept sliding down the nose. And I was going trying to like scrunching up my face trying to keep the glasses on my face never worked um but <clears throat> i so i've always been aware that there was something different about me aware that i have vision loss but it was not until i was about grade four or so when i realized that i really couldn't see that well like badminton is one of my Lee's, Lee's favorite sport. Why? The birdie too small, it's too fast. I had to have the yellow birdie in order to play. So one day in grade four, I'm playing badminton in PE class, and my p- opponent returns fire and it doubles. And so my partner is screaming, No, nah, get it, get it. And I run, oh, huh, with the birdie, and pull up and lands way on top of my head. <laughs> I had lost track of the ball. I'm sorry, birdie. So I realized that I needed to start asking people for help. Like, help. I would ask my classmates to tell me where the birdie is. So they would tell me, oh, it's behind you. It's to your left. It's to your right. And um, later on, as I got older, I realized that I was also having trouble seeing in the dark. Because not too long after, when I was about 11, I was playing with my three-year-old brother under a blanket and it was so dark inside and I couldn't see anything and my brother always knew where my hands were and I remember thinking oh my goodness how can he see I can't see a thing in here Sam how are you seeing this and my mom explained to me one more time that it was because I had vision loss so I was like okay I have to start asking people for help and so as life went on I started most of my struggle was with night blindness, like not being able to see the dark, because as an extrovert, as an outgoing person, I'm always wanting to meet new people, always wanting to make friends, always wanting to go out. So as my friends started to go out more often, like to the movie theaters where it's dark, or for you group at night time, we're playing hide and seek in the dark. So I would be like, hey, hold on, I need an arm. Can you bring me with you, or I would follow my friends around everywhere they went, and they were good sports. Um, so that was mostly what I struggled with as a teenager, 
then when I got to university, the struggle was still with the knife politeness. And for university, I actually chose to go to a school where I didn't know anybody. But <clears throat> before I went, I met with a um, di disability coordinator who, with the resident director, handpicked my resident assistant and Ruby. So the two girls knew that there was someone who needed extra help coming into the dorm, and so they helped me get around campus. They even willingly walked to my class to pick me up from my class in the dark, so that way I would get to know the campus. And after I got my to know the campus, I just walked around by myself, which is scary sometimes, especially at 2 in the morning, so I don't recommend it. <laughs> it was a safe campus, so don't worry, I wasn't attacked or anything. And um, later on, fast forward to three years ago, I actually moved to Hong Kong where I didn't really know anybody. And well, it was easier to get around with taxi, buses, MTRs, um, the SkyTrain version of for, for Hong Kong. It was everywhere. And so I was able to get around much more easily. But I still didn't know a lot of people, so I decided to make friends by joining a Dragon Ball team. But before I joined it, I emailed the team leaders saying, here is my situation. I have a hearing loss, and I can't see in the dark. What are the implications of joining the team? So what they did, they, the team leaders actually handpicked two team members who helped we get to the practice, and after practice, we were often to go out to dinner, which finished in complete darkness. Like, it, it gets dark faster in Hong Kong than it does here. And so they would just help me get to the train station so I could get myself home. So that was awesome. Um, but basically, when I'm looking back in, at all my experiences, badminton, seeing the dark, going out with friends, dragon boating, I had to really be humble and transparent, like telling people about my vision loss, explain to them what it is, show them how they can help me. Like instead of just dragging me around, I need to hold on to them or walk on the right side because my left ear is my good ear. So if they give me instruction, I can hear them more clearly. And so in doing so, People, I found that a lot of people are actually more than willing to help. They just didn't know how. So if you're able to explain to them, then they're, they're all for it. So even today, as a teacher, I don't have a full-time position yet, but as a teacher on call, I've taught in a few classes. I've actually noticed that a lot of students pick up on it and they want to help. So let's say I'm calling out a name and... She raises her hand and she's in this corner, but I'm looking here. So with my tunnel of fashion, I'm not seeing her. A student in that corner would go, oh, she's over there. And they point me in the right direction. And I actually also do tell them, sorry, class, I also have some fashion problems. So help me out. And they actually do. And they are so willing, which is fantastic. <clears throat> um, I've skipped a page, I think. Oh no, I haven't. So, so I. That's just what I've experienced. And even having them read out loud for me, I just tell them, sorry, I can't read out loud very well. So I rely on my students to help me. And they read for me. Like they all take turns. So, before I finish up, I just wanted to say that if I had to think about it, my advice is. Be willing to be humble and transparent. Tell people what you have. Show them how to help you. And don't let it stop you from living your life to the fullest. When they see that you're living your life to the fullest, they want to help you live it to an even fuller life. All right. Thank you so much for hearing me. And... Thank you so much for sharing with us, Natalie. And Carrie, please come share your story with us today. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Carrie, and I am 33 years old, so I technically have 
I've expired past the youth phase, but um, I sneaked in there, so I'm pretty happy to be speaking. So I guess I'm still young enough to to be here. Um, so we were asked to speak to a few things, and um, I'm going to touch on some of the things that were already spoken about, and I think I'll just wrap up and and touch on what was what was already said. So I grew up in um, the Lower Mainland. I grew up in Richmond and Coquitlam, moved around, uh, then li lived in Ontario for a while, and then uh, moved back to Victoria, where I did my undergrad at UVic. And I was uh, diagnosed at the age of two with moderate to severe hearing loss. I got my first pair of hearing aids when I was three. And then when I was 16, I started to experience night blindness. And I went to the eye doctor and was misdiagnosed initially. And it took about seven years before I was properly finally diagnosed with Usher syndrome type 2. So combining retinitis pigmentosa with, with the hearing loss. And so I was diagnosed, I think I was around age 24. At that point, I had about 45 degrees of vision remaining. And I am now legally blind and just have under 20 degrees of vision left. So um, we, were, we were asked to talk also about our initial reaction and to the diagnosis and and how we coped, and my initial reaction was relief um, because I finally knew what I had. It took so long, and so it was really hard to be just sort of struggling and but not having a name for my condition. So once I finally got that diagnosis, it was a relief to say, this is what I have, and this is how you can help me. Um, Obviously, I went through grieving periods as well. I had to give up my driver's license. Uh, you go through different phases. I had to give up team sports, um, could no longer play soccer or field hockey, couldn't play tennis, those kinds of sports. I was always very active. So I had to adapt and learn different sports. Um, and it's just this constant adaptation process with with degenerative vision loss. And that's one of the things that you, you do learn. Um, I started using the cane when I first started law school because it was such a big transition. And I was entering uh, a new school, new crowd of people. And I actually went and got counseling because the cane is the most difficult transition I think anyone can take. Um, so I, I went and got counseling to figure out how to get the confidence to use it. And then after about two years, I switched to a guide dog. So, so I've got Casey now, and I've had her for just over a year. So in terms of advocating for yourself, um, I advocate for myself every day in all different situations, and it really varies depending on the situation that I'm in. So there's, there's all different scenarios I run into, whether it's at work, at school, I advocate to family and friends, um, in the medical system, on public transit, out in the general public. And I f I've found that I've developed a style over time, just depending on what the situation is. And I think to be an effective advocate for yourself, you need to have accepted what you have. And I need to emphasize that if you feel ashamed or small or inadequate, that that will block your ability to effectively advocate for yourself. So that's one of the first things, is coming to terms with what you have. The second thing is to be comfortable disclosing what you have. I think disclosure is really important. 
because if nobody knows, then it's very difficult for them to help you. The third thing is to know what is reasonable and what you have the right to ask for. This can be difficult, um, but it's, again, something that you learn over time. It's also important to know when you are being mistreated, and it can be difficult to stand up to authority figures and question you know, what just happened there, but having the confidence to say, no, that was not right, regardless of what their position is. And finally, you, just what Natalie said, you have to know what you need and how to ask for it. And sometimes you don't know what you need, so you have to research. Um, so for example, you know, there might be technology that you're not totally familiar with, but it's kind of up to you to figure out what it is you need. So just some tips um, for how I've gotten I've improved my advocacy skills. Sometimes I practice what it is I want to say. If I'm going into a particularly, particularly difficult situation, I will workshop the situation with my husband and I practice saying different statements. And I'll just go through the scenario and he'll be the bad guy or the authority figure and I will practice what it is I want to say. Another tip I have is when I start to feel really anxious or just fearful in a situation where I'm, I'm really thinking ahead about what's going to happen, I know that I need to take steps to advocate for myself, to reduce my fear. So I know that something's making me very uncomfortable, so I need to take steps to make it less com more comfortable for me. So an example of this, we had to go, we went to the aquarium a couple weekends ago, and if anyone's been to Vancouver Aquarium, it's a nightmare when you have night blindness, <laughs> super dark, and I left Casey at home and I was taking my cane, and I was really anxious the day before because when you don't have any night vision and there's children running around, it's... It's very disorienting. So I pulled my husband aside and I said, you need to be on the ball tomorrow. <laughs> and you need to be a really great sighted guide. And he said, okay. So, because sometimes your sighted guide abandons you. <laughs> and I said, don't do that tomorrow. So that reduced my anxiety. Um, another tip I have is, I think a lot of people do this as you beat yourself up after a situation. So you sort of walk away and you say, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that, and you have the perfect comeback 10 minutes later. And th I do this all the time. I analyze the situation after. And the thing is, with advocacy, you're never going to reach a point where you're an expert. It's always going to be a learning process. So you never know what situation is going to arise, but the more you stand up for yourself, the easier and more natural it becomes. To help with this, I will often ask family and friends not to try to solve my problem, but just to listen. So I will sometimes coach someone and say, just tell me I said the right thing. That's all I want to hear. I don't want you to solve the problem or tell me what I should have said. Just say, Carrie, you did really well, and that's what I would have done. So I'm just looking for that empathy. I would also just um, wanted to add to pick your battles, know when to walk away. It's exhausting dealing with vision loss and hearing loss day in and day out. So there's some situations that I, I will just let slide. 
um, there's some, you know, random person shouts a crazy question out to me on the street, I will ignore them. And that's advocacy, is choosing what battles you're going to pick. Finally, just finding other people that have already gone through what you're going through and asking them for advice um, is always helpful. Okay, so just a couple um, more examples of recent advocacy efforts, and these are small little things. Advocacy is not some formal, um, big institutional thing. It's a day-to-day process. So just yesterday at work, I was presenting for a conference, and the lunch was a buffet. And again, it's just a nightmare when you are legally blind to navigate a buffet with a guide dog. And so I started getting really anxious in the morning, and then I just, that was my trigger. So I went to a colleague, and I said, the buffet, just so you know, it's going to be really challenging for me. So can you find me at lunch and hold my plate for me? and pile it up with food. So that's what we did. Another advocacy um, experience I've had is my mom would often join me. I think there's a lot of parents in the room here today. (laughs) Um, My mom would often join me in uh, various medical appointments, and she would often try to speak for me or she'd say, don't tell the doctor about the time that, you know, just really injecting herself into the appointment. And I had to learn over time to tell her, I can speak for myself and let me handle this. Um, and I know that's probably a difficult thing for parents to step back and, and let that happen. Um, one more example. A uh, couple week, weekends ago, friends of mine suggested that we go out for dinner at a dark restaurant. And I, again, advocated for myself. I chose a different venue. And I said, let's do it at your house instead. And you can cook me dinner. So, <laughs> um, so it's, just the, it's just those little things um, and they make a huge difference, and they just reduce your exhaustion and your fatigue, and they just make life easier. And just to end on a positive note, coming to this conference is a form of advocacy because you're educating yourself, you're meeting others who have the same condition, who are like you, and you are accepting what you have. So, congrats. Thank you.